Dobrý večer. A ďakujeme Slavovi Krekovičovi a Touchscreen Orchestra za úvodný koncert. A ja si dám toto úvodné slovo voľmi po slovensky a potom budeme pokračovať po anglicky, pretože naši hostia nehovoria po slovensky. A toto je záverečná diskusia v reseách zo série Reseák AT, kde sa stretávajú slovenskí a rakúskí architekti, respektíve architekti, ktorí pôsobia na Slovensku a pôsobia v Rakúsku, pretože tentokrát nemáme žiadnych rakúskych hostí, ale máme hosti z jedno. V diskusii Reseák pravdepodobne asi si vám nemusím úplne predstavovať, ale poviem vám, poviem vám aspoň približne. Od začiatku roku 2010 organizujeme panelové diskusie s pozvanými hostiami na témy konceptov v architektúre, prípadne architektonickej teórie. Väčšinou sa snažím udržiavať tie rozhovory veľmi abstraktné, preto väčšinou neukazujeme žiadne obrázky. Táto séria troch diskusí, ale naopak je s obrázkami, pretože sa budeme venovať forme v architektúre a asi bolo veľmi zložité rozprávať o forme, keď sme žiadnu formu neukazovali. Prebieha to teraz bude tak, že budeme sa asi zhruba dve hodiny rozprávať a na konci bude ešte jeden krátky koncert, ktorý ešte ďalej potom uvediem. No a po skončení koncertu budeme mať ešte pár tým. Začnem hovoriť po odbecky. So this was just a brief introduction and in slog. I'm pretty sure you understood everything, so I don't have to repeat anything. Um, this, is, this is actually a sequel of, of, of a discussion we had in, in Vienna about a month ago um, with, the, with almost the same guests. Actually, uh, the guests we have tonight are the same. We just have two more, uh, we just have two more guests. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't come uh, tonight. Uh, even though Ryan Zettel was announced, uh, he couldn't be here, he couldn't make it tonight. Uh, but uh, never mind, you can, you can find the recording of the previous discussion online. And this one um, is going to probably continue where we, where we ended the last time, or maybe we will repeat something. Um, what what uh, our guests got in common is that they all, all three are teaching somewhere, uh, either in Bratislava or in Vienna. And uh, I would like them to focus uh, in, in tonight's talk on the formal aspects of architecture. What I mean by formal uh, is that um, is the moment when architecture happens, when the architectural thinking happens, um, which is not so usual, usual in, in, in the tradition here in Slovakia, which is which I find mainly pragmatic, but um, there are different approaches. Um, maybe here also, but for sure in Vienna, um, when architects are actually uh, dealing with formal, aesthetic, um, non-functional uh, questions of, uh, or aspects of, of architecture. What I would like to, to find out tonight is um, what are the motivations, uh, where do the topics come from, and how to treat them. Uh, so let me introduce our guests. Uh, uh, the first one is Petr Stets, who is uh, the head of architecture department here in, uh, um, at the Academy of Arts here in Bratislava. Um, the second one is uh, Tyler Bornstein, who is uh, a teaching assistant at the postgraduate uh, program uh, Excessive uh, at the Angevante in Vienna. Um, he just recently graduated the program and became the, the teaching assistant. And uh, Dominic Strelitz, who is, uh, who is uh, teaching assistant here at the Academy of Fine Arts, the Department of Architecture in, in Bratislava. Um, well, we all are somehow also connected to Vienna. Um, we're commuting uh, here and there, or, or at least we used to. Um, my first question to, to all of, the, of our guests is, um, is very general. I would like to know um, actually what are you teaching, how are you teaching that, uh, where does it come from, and uh, why do you do it this way. And generally what I'm asking is what, what are the topics that you're dealing with. 
Later on, we will try to, to discuss a little uh, how do you treat them, but first I would like to know what and why. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think uh, since we are discussing form, formal approaches, I would like to uh, also say that in terms of teaching, I'm really interested uh, in how to formalize ideas. So. Our students um, are supposed to think about ideas as forms. I would like to mention that it used to be a synonym, where uh, the Greek idea was uh, translated as form from Plato into English. Um, and uh, my interest is really how to define um, kind of units of architectural thinking, of uh, spatial thinking, of uh, architectural concepts, and um, you know, it's not a totally um, out of the blue approach. Um, there is a lot of work being done on diagrams as a contemporary form of uh, representation that allows um, work with uh, ideas and their modifications. So students in the studio uh, dealt with topics such as uh, genealogies of various architectural ideas. For instance, we had uh, a semester worth of genealogies uh, looking at uh, sectional tropes. In, uh, what are specifically sectional ideas that could be described as forms into diagrams that could be mutated, that could be crossed over, that could be evolved. And so the idea is to really teach, to isolate ideas in architecture and to evolve them further by defining their um, um, specific um, representations that can be modified, mutated, evolved, traced into genealogies. Okay, so an easy question, but yeah. Um, so before getting into the specifics of it, which I guess will unravel as we continue with the talk, um, I would sum up what happens in Excessive Studio. I guess I'm like a liaison for Excessive tonight, but I guess at some point my own thoughts will lead into it. But what we are interested in is unapologetic figuration, let's say. So the idea of form generation as an autonomous act. And I think an important distinction um, of what takes place inside the studio that maybe separates it from other studios is the desire to create something new as opposed to something different. Um, I think there's an important distinction between those two that uh, we at least attempt to tackle in, uh, within the, the confines of the studio, but it's not such an easy problem. One of the, the difficulties of, of attempting something new as opposed to something different is that something different allows for comparison. So. Uh, the degree of familiarity with what you're working on becomes a little more obtainable because of the, let's say, the history or the memory, and so how you infuse certain ideas um, of history and memory and sort of creating precedence for what you're working on while developing something new becomes the challenge because it needs to be architecture. At the end of the day, it's architecture. It's not just experimentation, but it needs to have some mechanism for which it can be you know, judged, uh, whether it be successful or unsuccessful. So that becomes part of the challenge then. When, when you enter the program saying, OK, we're dealing with a formalist agenda, but that we're not interested in what took place before. I think that's maybe, that was my cue. Yeah. Um, well, what uh, I'm trying to do as a, you know, basically, you know, I'm a fresh teacher. I, I just, you know, I just started like a year ago. 
and, uh, and uh, you know, I guess I'm going to quit through at the moment. But you know, nevertheless, um, I, you know, I had the opportunity to actually um, try a bunch of ideas. Um, but what is, what is the most essential in, in my uh, perspective, like from my perspective, is that um, I would really love to see all those younger colleagues of mine, actually, because you know I'm not that, you know, we're just basically the same age, right? Uh, you know, developing their own ideas, um, and we, you know, being really free to do so. Um, and what I'm trying to help them with is to, you know, to formulate what these ideas are. So I, you know, I, I I'm mostly um, trying to ask them and not trying to tell them that much, you know. I, I, I don't have that much to tell. I, I, I'd rather try to figure out what they're up to. Because, you know, I'm pretty sure that from a, you know, from a group of students, like, let's say, you know, there's a bunch of people, uh, these, you know, ideas uh, are emerging. It's just uh, enough contemporary, let's say, uh, and enough grounded. You know, they have their own reasoning, and they have their own skill to figure out what makes sense and what doesn't. And I, you know, the only thing that I really want to do is that they push the idea forward until they see the result and then uh, until they can judge it, whether it's, it was worth it or not. And then, you know, of course, I try to provide them with some background of, you know, where, where do these things come from, what, you know, what does it resemble, uh, what does it refer to, what it might refer to, but um, I rather wait for, for their contribution. Um, and yeah, that's, that's mostly it. Um, I, yeah, um, we were discussing, uh, we were discussing uh, different formal approaches, uh, the two of us, but maybe, maybe we can establish some uh, common ground on this, maybe we can, we can establish the terms. Uh, if we are talking about formal approaches, uh, do you have any um, specific view on that uh, and a distinction? Anything that we could uh, use as, as a departure point uh, when we are talking about, um, when we are going to talk about different formal approaches? Uh, maybe, Dominic, you can, you can start. Um, and then I know that Peter has got some, some um, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it reminds me of a bunch of things. I mean, uh, you know, we're sort of probably coming, I mean, just just knowing each other, you know, we're coming from a little bit of a different perspective, I guess, since, you know, Peter's, Peter's talking about diagram and, you know, the uh, kind of intellectual uh, content kind of thing, uh, while, you know, Tyler is, I guess, on a, on a uh, you know, sort of opposite pole of the whole uh, situation, like, you know, like, as far as I know, uh, for now, you know, we would not appreciate a, um, you know, it's a intellectual mind brain thought, you know, thing. And then, you know, where I come from is, you know, I just, uh, um, I'm, I don't know, I'm not trying to fit, uh, you know, my thing into, into any particular genre. Just rather, you know, curious. So yeah. That, uh, actually, I was I was heading to uh, to the distinction we we kind of established when we were talking yesterday. Um, actually, it, it's your words um, that you find the formal approaches have two different modes. One is a design of research uh, that is being informed or maybe maybe uh, moderated. Whereas the other one is a free association process where um, it's mostly inspired. Well, that's a you know that might be an interesting point of discussion, like you know whether uh, whether we as designers, you know whether maybe architects, are you know sort of conceiving ourselves as part of like a broader science thing or more of a you know arty you know world of. Um, intuitive uh, solutions so on. So whether we can actually prove that something uh, works or is a logical result uh, or just not. And um, and of course, you know, this, these approaches are, are existing. I mean, you know, if you, there is a big tradition of, uh, of design research 
uh, worldwide. So basically, a situation where you would, uh, you know, um, figure out the thesis and you would push it uh, towards the results, um, you know, to understand uh, what are the consequences of your initial setup. So it's basically a scientific, sort of a scientific method, right? Um, although, um, yeah, I just I just wonder where, where you guys are because you know I'm, uh, I'm in neither of these. You know, I, uh, you know because. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just really, uh, you know, digging the digital arts uh, world, and I'm, I'm actually one leg grounded in, in digital arts communities, basically. Um, and then, you know, uh, architectural research is something that is, uh, you know, that I do for myself, but I, I would never try to explain things in such a way to anyone. So, you know, I would rather show the result, um, and you know, you like it or not. You know, I don't, I don't really, I don't really care about the discourse behind it so much. In, in my work, you know? why not? Well, uh, because you know, in the end, what matters is you know the, the qualities that, that are there. So you know, the effect that you're creating, whether it's uh, moving or not, and you know, the conceptual part is, uh, you know, it's something that I believe you can keep for yourself easily because you know. We're kind of half intellectuals here, you know, in, in architecture, I, I believe, really. And, you know, just trying to spam people with, with this kind of half intellectual talk is really, really boring, in my opinion. Yeah? So, you know, just, you know, uh, so, so I rather, I rather prefer to, you know, to exchange images, ideas, you know, on uh, the media that we're actually working on, um, and leave the discussion for the critics, maybe, you know. Uh, what about the, the public evaluation of all of the work? If you if you give up on explaining the the concept behind, then then it, your work is being evaluated uh, according to different standards. Then then it was created. How do you deal with this? Or what is? Well, uh, I think I, I don't know. In, in sort of um, in that discipline, like the only people uh, taking care about the uh, the concepts are architects themselves. So um, let's say, you know, either we want to be part of the geekiness of the closed circle of architects discussing architects' work, or uh, you know, you rather show the stuff and then you know you get responses from from elsewhere, and then you figure out what it is, you know, in, in faces of other people, you know, in, you know, reflecting uh, in, in other people's uh, you know words and whatever, uh, comments, if it's interesting. You know. I, I'm not really, I'm not, I'm not so much interested in the. In the closed architectural discourse, okay. in general. Then later on we will talk about the audience too, but um, let's carry on right now. Can you repeat, there were the two options that you were discussing, some uh, design research and yeah. inspiration? Yeah, but you can, you, can, you can actually agree with this. Uh, one of them was design research, yeah, and the other one was free association. Yeah, okay. Association? Yeah, free association or inspired. Okay, yeah. So like, I, I would I would say one of them is uh, informed, the other one is inspired, maybe. So I, I think this goes back to, and now I can kind of elaborate on what I was dis discussing with the idea of removing yourself from historical precedents, or I think what you're using is, is inspiration, that we focus more on research. And uh, one of the things that that does is it, it creates a void of some sort of mechanism for people to sort of critique what you're working on or at least drive it forward as far as its place contextually, whatever the context might be. Um, and so I think the way we handle that within the studio is uh, replacing it with the idea of rituals, which I think you're familiar with that uh, Hernan talks about. And so it, it took me a while to kind of grasp what he meant by the idea of ritual, but it's sort of those aspects of the culture that are so ingrained within the way you you know go about your everyday life that you're no longer thinking about it as much as maybe at one point within history it was sort of uh, more at the forefront of what the culture meant and so it, it's a way to kind of push the project forward without having to wear it on your sleeve let's say so it, it's it's embedded within it but it's it's somehow hidden so it's it's kind of like dealing with the flesh as opposed to the surface if that makes sense. And so for like an example, it would be... Um, do, is that all I get, the sliver? <laughs> yeah, I think we can find the picture. <clears throat> you can show the picture to the others and they can find it on their tablets too. Oh, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just 
Uh, one okay, then I'll, like, I'll explain it maybe. And so uh, one, one yeah, concept. That one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's what, I, what, what I mean. If you, if you look at which one? This one? Yes. Who am I, who do I have to show this to? <laughs> yeah. It's towards the end. The tables, and it, it came right after a cutlery set. And it's the idea that there's a certain formal uh, scenario of dining that you're no longer thinking about the actions, but the idea of sitting at a table and the organization of certain plates and uh, the, the flatware and the behavior that exists at that table isn't something that's ever really taught, but it's just sort of understood within that society to some degree. Um, and it's, it, it's, it has this really heavy historical presence that sort of just ghosted within the moment. And so now if we move backwards one. So that, that was a diagram then of like setting up a table, the actions that take place throughout the course of dining at a table, and then sort of what's left over. And the idea then that if you're dealing with something that is like a cutlery set, um, that sort of in very directly engages those rituals, but then you can start to inform behavior and be involved with behavior modification. So, okay, silverware is an integral part of that ritual. So what can you, you know, you're not eating without the, the silverware, and so how can you begin to manipulate like body modification? It becomes a question of behavior and perception of behavior and the perception of the the new forms that are somehow grounded within that unspoken history. And so the idea of, it's a flower set that Hernan had designed that the way you hold it is the only way that you can use it and eat. Your arms are kind of up in the air and you're sort of more primitive and um, it's sort of forcing a certain level of behavior that when you're interacting with it, but it's not necessarily inspired by something. So basically what you're saying is what I understood Dominic was saying before, that like you, there is something driving the, the design process behind that you're just not explaining directly and you're uh, letting the, the result show itself. I, I would agree with him that the, the final product is what matters and that, that's all that matters. Okay. Okay. Um, let's carry on. Okay, I actually prepared this time a little bit uh, from what um, could be an idea about form or formalism. And um, so it's interesting to hear the colleagues speaking, for instance, uh, of, of rituals or of the work of art that's not being analyzed, uh, but basically shown. I, I believe there are wide networks of meaning and uh, we look at literature, you guys look at music, um, you know, landscape architects look at architecture um, and vice versa to kind of shift ideas or forms um, around. So um, th th that's why I would like to introduce uh, some ideas of form uh, from literature where Somehow, the discussion perhaps started in Russia. Uh, and it has to do with the rituals, actually. But um, uh, maybe in, in a certain negation. So there was this Tolstoy uh, quote in the journal where he says, hey, I'm cleaning my room, but I don't remember whether I did clean my sofa. It was a ritual every week, he would clean and he would go through all the stuff and then he couldn't remember whether that damn sofa was has been cleaned or not. And so uh, he said, okay, if there was an external observer, he could say, yes, you did or you did not. But for the sake of um, the cleaning, it was as if it did not happen. And so also by extension, he was mentioning lives that go through such rituals where don't, they don't remember the actions are almost as if they were never, if they never happened. And um, so that's uh, an idea where then he thinks of introducing art 
as a um, uh, what would you call it distortion or defamiliarization, where art forces you to think of your cleaning and forces you to um, uh, actually clean everything differently or what you would uh, uh, see. And, and so this idea was uh, actually the start of the uh, Russian formalism, which I think is really interesting, where they say, okay, in art, you always have this function of making uh, the object, the artwork, the final product, uh, opaque, hard to be understood, um, not transparent, the meaning is not clear, and that forces you to look at it in a new way. And so, um, in poetry, they say uh, the structure of the poem is what forces you to focus on language, and so on the art part rather than on the meaning. That's just the per first uh, part of what I wanted to say in terms of formalism. I think it's, it's really, really interesting to um, bring in some processes uh, that make work new just by making it harder to understand in terms of meaning because of, of the form that kind of shifts the meaning. Well, it's a bit abstract, sorry, but I thought uh, maybe as a definition of, of how it's understood in general, uh, the, the, formal, the formalist uh, could be introduced. That means, okay, we bring in the form to, to look at the art, and again, not to have access to the function, to the meaning, but to just look at it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually like right in line with sort of what I was discussing with the, the rituals. As far as literature goes, the thing that comes to my mind that I think is really fascinating is, is one of those things that I, I... I like the idea of you cleaning, but you didn't remember that you cleaned because it's so integrated, and then taking that moment and forcing yourself then to really be analyzing what kind of rituals you undertake in the course of the day, but then specific to literature, uh, I, I'd be interested to know if there's ever a moment in, in a child's life or something that a blank page is shown to them and they don't have that, like if, if you were handed a blank page in China and Israel or here, let's say, and someone just said like, oh, start taking notes on this lecture, they would all be writing in a different way. There's a certain energy to a blank page, a piece of paper that really is identical across that spectrum. So like that's one of those rituals that I think is maybe from a different sort of artistic realm that then you can begin to analyze and how you utilize that notion of going through it so thoughtlessly and assessing that and seeing how you can bring it back into, let's say, a formal architectural agenda. Um, I showed you both of you uh, the, the clean example. Um, Maybe uh, would you uh, would you refer somehow to what Tyler said about new and different? He said that the new is completely new; it's a challenge, whereas different is showing the history. So the ritual of cleaning and making it a little different so that you remember is it, is it new or different? Or, or is it is it something that you would refer to uh, subscribe to? Okay, for, for myself, I would go one step further because I would consider uh, the idea of uh, form as making the understanding uh, new. You know, I believe from the beginnings, as we try to explain or come to the origins of uh, the formal research and of the formalists, but I actually don't believe much in. Uh, newness, uh, it's a difficult question really, uh, I, I think really uh, we, we are working with the diagrams with these uh, notions of genealogies which imply, you know, that whatever is on the cusp of the way that's currently happening is new no matter what it is, uh, but that uh, we are interested in the differences uh, as in any language, that means we are 
trying to in studio, in the office, and everywhere uh, with with um, colleagues, friends, and so on, define the differences, make them sharper, look at nodes where uh, ideas start to bifurcate. That's all about creating crossroads from which different ideas can um, uh, spawn, and then kind of combining the results of different crossroads and evaluating and so on. So I'm more interested in difference than in newness. And so to come back to your question, um, uh, the cleaning for me would be interesting in terms of what instrument uh, makes the perception of the cleaning different or what form of cleaning makes it present to your mind anew as you live through it as a portion of your life and so um, and so uh, I think any that you perceive is as good as any other and whatever is new is at the moment you're cleaning but I'm interested in how to make it different Miller, is, is the cleaning for you new or different? I, I, I'm not sure that that's really the, the root of where the question is. Let's say that's that's the opportunity to infuse what... You, when you're not aware of the actions that you're taking part in, that for me is then the opportunity to create a sense of familiarity with something new. So I would associate it with the new and that's sort of what I would say we try to infuse formally because it's a way to kind of get people to feel a, a sense of con, you know connectivity to let's say the architecture because that's what it's about right now without you know having to look like what it's sitting next to you know it's not contextual in the sense that it looks like it belongs where it is but it feels like it belongs where it is and so that, to go back to the cleaning, it's that you don't think about the cleaning just like you don't necessarily think it's out of place because the actions that take place within it are familiar. Okay. Um, let's, let's go, uh, let's be a little more specific now. Okay. I think what is, what is interesting in that metaphor is, is actually, you know, because what we're talking about is, is putting thing, things in order, right? So like, you know, uh, what does it mean to put things in order? And you know, if you know how to put things in order, you simply never notice the order anymore, right? Because it's it's just uh, obvious. So um, so so now the question is whether you know what are the methods that we're using to go into that room and create a disorder, a disorder that is disruptive enough to challenge our imagination. And so you know, therefore, I mean, we can be more specific, maybe, because you know what what Peter just said. Uh, he said that he's not interested in, you know, making a mess. He's interested in looking at the elements that he already has, you know, on the fingertips, and you know, looking at them carefully and reassembling them, and you know, making things a little bit different. While you know, where I would, you know, position myself on a contrary, let's say, is rather you know, entering that room and making a mess, and then finding spots within that mess that attract my you know, attention, and then, you know, taking it further. Do I, do I get it right, like in terms of a, a metaphor? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we're talking about metaphors, but I just wanted to bring it back uh, to the specific relationship to architecture. I think, you know, we describe cleaning, and uh, it's funny that, in fact, I consider uh, architecture to be really about ordering and disordering, or about uh, metaphors of order, concepts of order, and how do you organize or order or disorganize for that matter, you know. Uh, uh, but, but, but you really have to think of the structure, how you put things together or, or, or break them. I mean, that's really how I understand the process of um, uh, making architecture, but maybe you guys uh, have a different Position. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think there's a there's a clear clear difference. I mean, I you know I, I sort of believe that you know you can um, um, you, 
came to another a little bit uh, uh, the desire to uh, to control the stuff in the first place and just rather you know uh, focus on what you get from whatever uh, whatever technique you're using to uh, you know to come up with a messiness. Uh, uh, just yeah, uh, I, I would like to be a little more specific yeah. at this point. Um, because maybe we, we are talking about very abstract stuff, uh, so maybe we can we can start to talk about um, uh, some projects that we've been working on or some topics that you're uh, particularly uh, interested in. Um, not just to describe the project, but I would first in the first round I would uh, like to focus on on the topics that uh, that your work has been dealing with and also where do the topics come from. I mean, where, where do they come from? How do you how do you actually decide that this is something that has to be explored? If so, um, how do you how do you define uh, the topic of, of the exploration and how do you treat it uh, later on? I don't know. I don't you can you can start because you got a microphone. Maybe maybe we can also again look at some some of the pictures of the tablets. Um, if you pick some pick some. Yours are at the beginning, it's alphabetically. Maybe that. Yeah, maybe that. This one. So let's talk about this one. Um, well, so it, um, probably there's. Yeah, it's not going to be seen anyways, but. Um, uh, well, well <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to tell. the beginning. Seeing it. On, the, on the left, left part. But anyway. Okay. Just. So yeah, it's um, um something that I uh, I don't know I was doing for quite I, I don't know like two years already. It's it's, it's an obsession to uh, to create spaces which are uh, saturated, and it's a it's it's a it's a term that I I don't know I, I thought describes. Uh, what, what I'm doing quite well, um, and um, the whole idea was to, um, you know, if you think of a body, it's a, you know, it's a matter organized in such a way that it has a lot of particular, uh, you know, spatial qualities. Uh, but actually, what it is is just very different densities of matter uh, having different properties. And you know, I was sort of obsessed with this idea and trying to figure out, um, you know, how can you actually treat spaces, um, you know, that way. So you know, instead of describing them as a discrete, um, you know, relations between parts, I would rather, um, you know, uh, try to figure out how to uh, set up matrices of intensities within space. So that uh, you know the shape, the articulation, the color, the texture uh, is is part of the uh, you know of a particular process that becomes recorded as a space. And you know just, just you know it sounds very vague and abstract, but what, what it means in the, uh, in practical terms is that um, I explained it to you yesterday. It's, it's you know basically what I figured out is that you can create spaces in a similar way like people would do um, magnetic resonance, but reverse. So, you know, if you're making a magnetic resonance of your body, what you get is a free model based on intensities within your body. Uh, so, I basically started writing software that would allow me to, instead of scanning something, rather set up intensities um, and then observe uh, spaces emerging out of that. So, I would deal with generative processes that, uh, that influence each other and create all this um, uh, you know, different intensive qualities, um, and it, you know, and then I would, I would observe the effects. In this way, it sort of um, um, it helps me going out of what I know, because basically, uh, you know, I, I'm dealing with something that I have never seen before, um, and then you know, uh, since it's all generative, I can go through the spaces that I that I, uh, that I create and evaluate whether you know. I'm going towards the, the effects I want or not. So it's um, it's the whole idea of you know creating an environment for yourself to explore um, you know what you thought in a very blurry way in the first place, but it goes more and more um, interesting the way you go. Yeah. 
stuff like that. I mean, it's, you know, it's simply not visible there. So, you know, I'm talking about some pretty yeah. abstract stuff at the moment. But, but, as, um, but anyone can see that on the table as it's so uh, the first set of pictures on the left. Um, yeah, but we've shown that one. Um, yeah. I, I, I was, I, I would, to repeat the question, I would like to know where does the topic come from and how do you treat it? And, and in the next round, I would like to ask you about the evaluation, evaluation process. Uh, how, do you, how do you verify um, and what do you refer to when you uh, think about how successful you were and what you established as a, as a problem? So I, I, I think it's good that you sort of threw the brakes on the, the metaphor that was sort of getting out of control there, mostly because I, I'm much more interested in the application of ideas, that for me, the, the development of the discipline of what we're working on is something that takes place in the actual doing, so uh, I'm not as interested in the discussion unless the discussion can really lead to something that's very tangible as far as its architectural uh, presence and so I think I'll, I'll get to your question. I know I'm going a roundabout way to it. Um, probably. <laughs> we'll go the long road. Um, no, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll save it because I think it'll come up later. Um, I think as far as what we're interested in right now, one of the ways to sort of balance out the the, the struggle to tackle on, I guess, what I'm calling new forms is to balance it with something that's very conventional to the field of architecture. And so one of the fascinations that I have at the moment is dealing with the line. What is the line's role within the discipline? I know that seems really simplistic, um, but really at the, the fundamental level of what we do are, you know, you represent things in plans and sections. I don't think you can ever really remove yourself from that. Actually, the one before that would be better, but I've lost faith that we'll get a good glimpse. Oh, I was going backwards, it's upside down. <laughs> yes, that one. But you need me to do it. No, just OK. Because, I mean, we're, in a plan or a section, you're drawing lines, but it's actually representing something. So I'm much more interested in the idea of drawing with materials and how the idea of a delineated object can manifest itself tectonically and uh, what relationship that you can have, that you can draw from the, the drawings and then the forms that you're working with. And I think one of the, the more interesting case studies of someone who, who dealt with this idea was Enrique Mirales. And he did this really interesting drawing where he, he did a very pragmatic, detailed drawing of a croissant. And it has like 52 cross sections that he sort of unrolls. And it's like if you were to hand a, a set of construction drawings to someone and said, build me a croissant. So the parallel for that would be then taking these new forms and, and, and tackling them with a very pragmatic viewpoint of uh, how you represent them and what the representation means, and then you know almost blending the idea of what it is what is a design document and what is a construction document because I don't think that there needs to be a distinction between the two in the discipline, and uh, then it gives you certain capabilities as far as the representation that there you can sort of deal with a layering that the two dimensional like a thick two dimensional graphic can lead to sort of re, uh, a legibility of a three-dimensional space. Space is the wrong word, but three-dimensional forms. So the idea of the, the continual layering of the line leading to something that's closer to an MRI, let's say, or something that's more topographical, where it, it has a sense of three-dimensionality to it. I'll stop you there. Okay. Um, uh, again, the Back to the, the original question, where does this topic come from? Is it something that is, um, you said it's a fascination, but could you... No, fascination is a bad word. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's what... You it, want it, to... it's, it's drawn from a need to balance, that there's, there's a driving force that you need to, that, that you deal with when tackling the, the concept of rituals, that you deal with highs and lows. 
um, the, the brutal and the pristine, but some, some sort of polar opposites that are driving the force forward. And so the idea is that it comes from, when you're working with new forms, the, the need to represent them in, in ways that are legible, let's say, uh, that you balance them with something that's very conventional within the discipline. And so then it's, it's dissecting the discipline and seeing what opportunities you have then to be balancing the new forms. That the, the, you push the process forward through that the sort of internal struggle. The importance is that, it, that it's an internal struggle that's driving it forward. It's not the external. So does that get closer? Yeah, but, but um, OK. So, 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 so you articulate an internal struggle, and that's actually the problem that you're going to deal with. Correct. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I remember we've been talking about this uh, the last time uh, in Vienna, and because I was yeah, I, I think I probably used the term co-evolutionary tangles. Probably. Yeah, I don't remember. That uh, that there's this predator prey relationship that uh, is the driving force between something. Um, so the idea that like a, a zebra that eats grass. There's a certain limit because of its lips that it doesn't eat the grass too far that it doesn't grow back. And so they've evolved over time with this relationship between each other. But again, getting away from the metaphor, it's an internalized mechanism that's pushing it forward because it's not something that's relying on contextual influences. Again, you need to go back to the, the rituals. Um, Again, where, where do the topics come from? How do you treat them? And why? Uh, okay, uh, I can get get back to that. But I like that uh, coevolutionary thing with the zebra. I, I have one with the the, the bats and the moths. Uh, I, I like it because it's far less exciting than someone wants like lion and gazelle. But I like that it's grass. It seems a lot a lot more mundane. <laughs> But actually, when you mentioned zebra, I, I was really thinking about the stripes or something, because you could you could use okay. a sheep or something. It's a horse. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I once did a lecture with the, also the moth as the mol, mola, uh, the little uh, insect that is chased by bats and that can actually hear the ultrasound of the bat, and then also and then also deflect them and confuse the bat uh, by sending back sounds that make it uh, noisy, make it appear noisy in the ears of the bat, which would mean the eyes of the bat. And the, the lecture was about the, the, the relation between weapons and uh, uh, re uh, reinforcement, the, the, the kind of the one that I mean. But, but this idea of systems that uh, evolve, that react one to the other, is also what I'm really interested in. Uh, but I think I'm working on it from a, a, a kind of position where I'm trying to simplify each element to make it clear. To s if, if, you, if you could see somewhere, I can point to the, the images uh, uh, where um, there, I always, I always work. Yeah, with this one, for instance, I always work with sets of models with whole generations that I either do by hand, uh, as you can see uh, over there. That's the lens of um, virtual models or physical models. So I always have sets that relate one to uh, each other, um, and, um, and even the stupidest house. Uh, doing right now has uh, 70 iterations which is kind of obsessive but uh, it's trying to uh, put any kind of pragmatic and purely formal aspects into the cycle of uh, doing the simplest thing even um, but it's hard to see in these images I mean okay something stabilized uh, over there in my diploma project uh, that would be the main and simple goal I have, uh, but I could also discuss more specific ideas uh, based on the project. 
uh, when, when I saw the presentation, however, I thought like, hey, I'm not gonna, ever gonna show you uh, what I mean because it's constantly moving. <laughs> and so it's funny because here is uh, formalist projection par excellence. Uh, I mean, congratulations, Ian, for, for your uh, formal um, projection that um, one could really analyze, you know, when we're talking about form as completely obfuscating meaning and so making the uh, medium of projection perhaps even more um, uh, present on, on itself. Uh, I like it, it is uh, ideas where everybody uh, tries to, uh, uh, to uh, add some of their um, input. But, okay, one more specific idea, because we are very um, abstract. So, I mean, we did this competition, maybe it will appear or not, the green thing. Uh, and it's also about ideas of how to organize, not even space, because I don't even believe in space so much. Hey, great. This one, for instance. Um, and, and the, the competition grew out of uh, my fascination with fractals as a, a way of uh, exploding the boundary between two functions. If you have a wall and Ryan is very modernist about this, uh, you um, divide, let's say, uh, a toilet from a bag, from a... But, but it's all in a, in a plane. What, what I was very interested in studies of suburbs, for instance, was that the boundary of the suburbs based on the research is, is becoming infinite, while actually the area of the suburb is finite. And uh, so the competition grew out of this uh, goal to achieve an infinite boundary between the project and the city that surrounds it. Um, and. Uh, you know, to kind of negate this idea of the space as something that's in the box, because you have the space, it's somehow located, but the area to the rest of the city is um, taken to the roof. That was just a quick summary. Um, while you're speaking, actually, you mentioned it a couple of times and also the last time um, we were talking about discreteness and atomizing structures uh, the last time today you said that you're trying to formalize units of architectural thinking um, can you elaborate on that a little uh, last time in Vienna we were uh, discussing um, digital architecture that always appears smooth which is uh, to me somehow, or I'm not saying always, sorry for the, for the uh, generalization, it always appears, uh, it, it, it often appears shiny, smooth nerve surfaces and, and all that, while at the bottom of the process there are the digits. I mean, even the surfaces in reality cannot be precisely defined because they are lacunary even in the you can you can only compute approximations of the surfaces but okay that's too theoretical i think what's really interesting on digital uh, anything as well as on uh, atomic perception of the world we could look at the history of science we're always uh, looking at new particles helped to jump to the next level of understanding the world and so on. So, uh, by extension, uh, I'm also interested in how to do the same with ideas that comes from, uh, you know, John Cosa's work on um, artificial invention systems where you define that they're trying to um, come up with new ideas. So. Yeah, how you formalize the oppositions uh, in, in architecture, you know, different terms, different spaces, and how do you uh, mutate them further?
I think uh, it's hard to show what uh, <laughs> that could look like. Sorry about that. Um, okay, um, let's, let's talk about a specific project at the moment where we will demonstrate very thoroughly the, the treatment of, the, of a topic and articulation of, the, of a topic. Um, and then also I would uh, like to know the verification process or the, the evaluation process. Um, Dominic, if, if, if you could um, pick one of your one of your projects that, that is in the, in the presentation and, and talk a little more thoroughly, uh, particularly about that. Okay. Um, well, Again, how, how, did you, how did you pick the topic? How did you articulate it all right, and, all right. and verify? Okay, okay. Well, um, How can we do it? <laughs> can we? Yeah, if we ask people to look at this picture, it will be very good. Okay. It's, it's showing up a little. Um, well, because, I mean, probably has to do a little bit with, um, you know, with the discrete and, um, and the continuous and uh, digital and, you know, things like that that, that you were talking about. Um, well, that was literally that, that was a, a longer process where uh, where I was really focused a lot on the on the resolution on the topic of resolution. So uh, and basically the idea of representation versus uh, you know uh, sort of application. So so something that probably Tyler was was also talking about a little bit, uh, where you know the distinction between architectural drawing uh, and the construction drawing, so architectural sketch and construction drawing. Uh, sort of becomes, um, as, let's say, unnecessary. And uh, um, you know, I was uh, I was experimenting quite a bit with, uh, you know, first of all, understanding the topic of resolution. And here, um, the idea was that you know I, I started uh, literally sketching with, you know, if I sketch on a computer, um, I actually sketch with pixels, right? So I started moving pixels around, uh, shifting them. Um, and you know, establishing new relations between the colors and, and so on and so forth, um, in a in a kind of super lo-fi manner, um, and then you know, so I started treating that as an architectural sketch or something that would give me ideas further, and then you know, what resulted from that was a whole uh, range of, uh, of further developments that that were actually based on. Uh, you know, setting up things with a particular resolution. So uh, uh, some of them were digital. So uh, you know, I would I would work with free space, which is discretized, but in the end, uh, you know, uh, creates continuous uh, uh, bodies. On the other hand, I would work with machines that that have particular resolutions. Um, so you know, they're not. Um, uh, Based on the ideal representation of whatever, but they rather do something specific, something particular. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really, I mean, it's really, really difficult uh, because uh, I guess uh, you yeah, know, no one knows what I'm talking about. Um, um, but it's really possible to find the picture on the table, so <coughs> if you find it, then. We're talking about the same stuff. Um, the, uh, the last part of the question was the verification. The verification, the evaluation. When, when, when do you think that you actually are, are done? Or, or uh, I, don't, I, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm done. I don't want to be done, you know, I just... Okay. No, no, there's just like, you know, it's a, I think it's a, it's a general situation that you... Uh, you know, you create something, and then if um, if it's inspiring enough, you take it further. You know, if it's not, you, you just stop. But but basically, you know, I would rather I would really like to treat you know my work as something that is at the moment what I you know what I have on my fingertips. But then it's uh, you know it's going on, right? So it's it's not that I'm I'm finished in particular you know moment. It's just like. I generate a bunch of pictures, and I generate a bunch of you know models, prototypes, and there are steps, in, uh, and you know, that's okay. it. 
So, we had Jeffrey Kipnis visit us in studio once, and he, because the studio is named Excessive, asked us why it wasn't actually named Just Right, because he thought all the projects that get done in there, they, they feel correct the way they are, so how can you define that as excessive? And of course, no one could answer him, but mostly because no one had thought about it. And so, I, I think part of the, the learning of what he meant by that takes place in going too far, and that's sort of how excessive comes into play, that once you become excessive, it's, it's an understanding of when you've kind of gone one step too far, and then you need to scale it back, and that's sort of the moment that you know when it was finished. Uh, whether that's easy or not to tell, I think it's a different question. Um, to answer what you were asking, um, I forgot the specific wording, but I'll talk and you can tell me if I'm answering it. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Um, so you wanted a specific example of, of what it is that we're talking about, and so I think what's important, uh, I'll go back a little bit first to the distinction of the research, and I think an important moment in the, the research that I do is that it starts with experimentation, and the experimentation has a sense of arbitrariness, that you don't go into it with an agenda but you use it as a mechanism to produce results, and then you analyze the results, and that becomes the research. The, the research then, in that sense, becomes a very tangible catalog, which becomes the, the way that you can formulate a decision-making process. And so for me, it was always important to start with something that was an analog, because if you start digital, for me, it was always difficult then to bring it back into the, the analog world, because it, you, basically create whatever you want, it's this sort of fake perfection that you know you can 3D plot anything you want, but for me that was really not a satisfactory result. So it started with the analog study where you can, before entering you know, the digital realm, understand the formal capabilities of how you're working and then translate it that, you know, through some mechanism, depending on what type of platform makes sense, um, into the computer. The last time you were talking about the imperfection, yeah. um, that you're interested in imperfection, is, is it still so? It's been a month, it, it would have changed. Uh, no, I, I'm still interested in imperfection. I think, I think what's interesting is a shift over time from the capacity to create something that you strive to be perfect through imperfect means, and we now have kind of inversed that relationship that we have perfect methods, and so there's a desire to create something imperfect, but how you can create something that's genuine and how you implement those sort of spontaneous moments becomes the challenge, because choreographed spontaneity is still, you're, you're in such hyper control of it that it sort of bends the definition of what is imperfect. Um, but uh, I think a specific example then of of what we do in, in the studio is um, because there's a, a, a formal agenda, inherently you're dealing with the term ornament a lot. That becomes part of the criticism that people throw at you, like is it what you're dealing with just ornament? And I, I actually, I have no problem with that term. I think people today often think of that as a, as a dirty word in architecture. I don't. Um, and then his, historically, ornament would be applied to already important moments in a design. And it was used to sort of highlight that in a very pragmatic way, especially connections. And so my intention is to sort of explode that logic, that you take important moments and you, you sort of overwhelm them with so much ornament, rather than highlight them uh, and highlight the function that it has, you overwhelm them with so much ornament that it becomes totally useless. And so you inverse that relationship by... That's you know, the excessive moment. That's, yeah, so that's the excessive moment. So there's a slide in here somewhere. Yep. Where it was dealing with the sense of, you know, how do you tackle the idea of aperture? And so that would be a moment, like a window on a building would be one of those moments where you highlight things, you know, the little, you know, plaster reliefs. 
a little columns on the sides or planter boxes or something like that. And so I decided, okay, that can be a moment that's so exploded with ornaments that you sort of lose the sense of aperture altogether and it becomes sort of this playful moment of uselessness. And I think that in many ways is the, the goal. Not that the overall is useless, but that you bring back the notion that architecture should have integrated into it a degree of playful uselessness. And so this, this was a moment where I was studying with the idea of like operable ornament, that the, the window doesn't actually exist, it's 100% ornamental, and that, that you infuse the function into the ornament, rather than using ornament to highlight the functions. That's fine. Um, um, before I, I, I give the same um, question to Peter, probably uh, again about um, one of the projects, maybe. Um, in the next round, we'll be uh, in the next round. We are going to uh, give the opportunity to the audience um, to, to talk to you, and um, and afterwards, I would like to discuss a little what is the what is the audience for your work. Um, who do you communicate to and uh, who do you relate to? But um, before, um, could, you, could you again be um, pick a specific project and, and describe the, um, the methods you use and, and the verification process uh, you have? Okay, uh, just very quickly, any of the projects are trying to explore the continuum. Uh, either, as in this one, I, I, I learned one has to move it always to the same image because they are rotation. So there's one where you can see that the program explodes, uh, the continuum of, of program explodes into steps, the, the cloud of different functions uh, becomes um, uh, discrete and there is one element uh, that changes in a gradient from column to uh, space to uh, merge the big hall and so on. Uh, and also um, in the further projects there is um, the explosion of process into steps, uh, you know, how do you manage kind of the evolution of uh, models to incorporate more and more um, steps. There's one uh, that tries to deal with the, the, the wall as a thick surface that is only an aggregation, as in this one, of small elements um, th that create a wall that's spatial, which is um, a bit of a um, oxymoron because normally obviously it's a surface. So, those are various studies of uh, making elements out of projects, but the, the evaluation is very difficult always. I mean, I, I wish I had a clear set of rules, but they're always different. I mean, are we doing this to uh, look cool, new, win? Uh, uh, there's always uh, research. I mean, about curiosity, but uh, I think the idea that uh, one retains is across very different categories and one focuses then either on a programmatic idea or on a formal processual idea. It's, it's very different in each project and then one just tries to define the, the structure. So that's the question, you know, in terms of evaluation I cannot answer right now. This is the moment when you can join in. Um, if you have any uh, question or comment or anything, this is the moment. Are you sure? Should I ask a question? I can ask them a question. Ask them a question. <laughs> no, I actually have a, a question for, for Peter when he was talking about the um, also being interested in sort of the, what I was calling the co-evolutionary forces that you're dealing with something that drives the, the project forward. I was, def um, I define the forces somehow internally that push the project forward. Um, so I, I would be curious then for you, where, how, how do you see those forces? Where do they come from and what sort of 
relationship do you establish between them? Yeah, I mean, it's a nice uh, topic, I think, for the talk, for the research. I, I think it also relates to uh, the understanding of uh, form and formalism in terms of what I work on. I'm not sure this is going to be easily uh, understood, but as a discussion, uh, you know, I have fun. So, uh, I believe that um, any evaluation can only happen on form or some formal relationships anyway. And so, uh, it's about defining those formal relationships within the project, let's say, or also in relation to external um, uh, inputs. So, you know, Pierre Vittorio Aureli would say, okay, this is architecture until its boundary and then its forces when it reacts to other urban um, artifacts or to politics. I mean, it's, it's politics made from that surface on. But, but you take it into uh, the architecture as a formal criterion. Okay, how does it change uh, size, shape, whatever. So yeah, I, I always try to define some internal structure, um, but it can also have external inputs to modify. It. So so it's not always from the inside out that the evolution will kind of happen. Uh, it's also never complete or perfect. It's always from what. I work on, but I will be interested in the discussion and how you understand it. It's always um, uh, an incomplete structure, an incomplete uh, formal uh, framework that then reacts to uh, even made up forces. And uh, that's the design. You know, we're not creating something that works on all levels, we're creating foster. Uh, phosphorescent rabbits, they do something, but they don't do other things. That's what I'm interested in. I mean, we pick the criteria, we pick the influences, we pick the uh, structure, and that's the project. I don't know if, uh, how hard do you work with it? So, uh, so then, when, on some level, you're saying sometimes it's internal, sometimes it's external. Uh, how do you begin to define specifically the external forces? Because then it becomes, for me, uh, issues of context and how that because uh, I think that for me that's always an interesting argument of how someone that's open to the idea that they're a formalist de deals with the idea of having to place the design within a context I think that's always a difficult you know one of the difficult arguments that formalists have to make what do you mean by, um, do you mean by context uh, quite, I mean, in the, in the very literal sense, it's direct surroundings, because if we're talking about architecture as a real thing, as opposed to a conceptual thing, it has a, it has sight. And the idea of how you relate to your context, as a formalist, it's very difficult to use the traditional means of, you take what's next to you, and you assess its relative scale, its relative materials palette, and sort of the type of appropriate functions within the city, and you work within a certain realm, let's say. You create a Venn diagram, and you're somewhere at least in the middle of certain parts of it. But I think that's difficult then for a formalist to, to sort of free themselves from that, but sort of continue an argument for placing the building where it specifically is. Uh, I would perhaps have two approaches. One would be the morphology. I would formally define uh, the elements and compare them to existing morphologies and kind of make variations, interpolations, and so on. And the other one uh, would probably be to uh, again generate a system that produces difference and then and then just dump the criteria on it based on I don't know light, uh, traffic. You know, I like dump criteria these days. Like, Accessibility and stuff, but I like the random uh, generated um, responses to them. So either you know the morphology and like interpolations from what we know, or or or. I think I think um, 
this might be a little related, and um, I hope I remember quite well because I've heard uh, Jan Tabor quite recently um, saying that he, I'm, I'm, I'm not really ready to quote him, but as from what I remember, he said that any experiment in architecture that is really architectural can only happen in the domain of aesthetics. Um, Who is he? He is a <laughs> he's a theorist based in Vienna. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, he's been a he, he's been a theorist for the Zahadid Studio at the Antwerp. Um, he was. Um, now he is um, he's just a um, free theorist based on Vienna. Can you re can you repeat the book? I'm I'm, I'm not really I'm not really sure. I'm not really that, I'm not really but checking it. But, 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 but the notion is that um, that any kind of experiment that is architectural can only happen in the domain of aesthetics. Because any other experiment would not be architectural. That was actually the, the point of the thing. I mean, I, I would need time to process that, and I would be curious to... Do you have one? I would, I would disagree. I could, I could say it's also in terms of any architectural tropes what uh, relates to the formal structure. Uh, you know, sequencing of space and all that. I mean, aesthetics is a, is a general category that takes all your, um, all your um, essential inputs, but, but uh, basically, uh, you know, it can only happen on the level of the concept. Okay. Um, the last, um, the last round, uh, I guess. Unless you have any other topic you would like to discuss, would be what I announced is the is the audience that um, um, if you're addressing by word, what kind of audience is where is it um, based? Is it locally locally bound or is it kind of a school or discourse? And actually, what I would like to here or talk about is that um, if you are pushing the boundaries, what boundaries are you pushing? Is it the boundaries of what people around you understand as architecture or is it pushing the boundaries of the architecture of this course? And who are the people around you and are the people physically around you that people who actually would perceive the architectural uh, product or are, the, are those the people who are distributed around the globe uh, and connected by different networks and you can you can have uh, people who are just like you located somewhere completely else and wh what is the yeah, uh, what is the audience for, for what you do and maybe it's not the people maybe it's it's a discord itself normally you haven't been talking for quite a while well, um, you know since, uh, um, you know, at the moment I'm, I'm mostly um, um, dealing with, with digital art actually, uh, much more than, than you know, uh, really uh, architecture, so, uh, you know, the, the audience is, uh, is basically, uh, you know, distributed. Um, well, maybe, you know, uh, what is interesting here is, um, the fact that nowadays the content is created in a distributed fashion. So you know, it's uh, there are basically ideas that repeat. If you uh, you know, if you browse, uh, you know, there are things that, that seem to be similar. So basically, uh, I believe that the content is actually evolving through the networks, um, and then it's if it's successful, it's being implemented locally. So by the you know by the very uh, um, local sets of uh, concrete, um, uh, you know, needs and, and, and people that actually want to want to do this. Um, well, what is what is happening at the moment, which I, which I find uh, extremely extremely interesting, is uh, the possibility to actually crowdfund the architecture. So basically, um, uh, a big shift in funding. Uh, you know, uh, there is there is one precedent at the moment. One project that is actually being built that way. 
but uh, I think it's, it's just a extremely fascinating perspective that you won't have any more uh, one specific client, but it might be that you have that, that you're going to have a group uh, of people that support a particular idea or support a particular uh, view on what should be, uh, and they might gain enough of uh, you know economic or political power to actually purchase the site to actually. Uh, you know, uh, create structure right there. Uh, this is at the moment happening in, the, in um, uh, Bogota. Uh, there is a huge skyscraper being built just from crowdfunding money. Uh, so it, it's basically, you know, very many people that actually support this project. And uh, and I think, I mean, this is, this is really the, the, the future of, of what I what I want to be in, basically. Uh, so not anymore, sort of, uh, you know, architect as a as a person who creates a corporate identity icon. But rather, you know, uh, a situation where you uh, where you set it up with a group of people that support a particular view on what space could be and what do they need, um, and you know, it's distributed. Then um, a certain moment happens um, once you once you have the audience that is uh, um, that is uh, related to what you do, uh, actually fans of. of of the work, even if you crowdfund something, those are people who are actually willing to uh, or like what um, what is being done. And once you turn it into something real, you, you change the audience. Uh, while uh, the audience before was was really into the thing itself, that it was it was positive about the thing. Once you actually build it, it, it becomes part of a certain environment where people don't really have to be. Um, into into that, though so they have to be positive. Which I find it really it great. Changes a lot. Which I find is a really great uh, opportunity of, uh, of, the, of this discipline to actually create this unsettling circumstances. Uh, this is basically going back to the topic of uh, you know setting things in order. I mean, you know, really, if there is if there is anything cool about this discipline, uh, is that you know you can create large scale. Uh, you know, objects that make people behave a different way or think a space a different way. And you know, if um, and that's the ritual again. Yeah. So I, I really believe this is uh, you know this is an awesome perspective. If if you imagine that there is a community of people being able to build something in a particular place, and then it becomes you know like a um, uh, well a bit unsettling for, for for people being around there. I mean, I think it's quite an awesome perspective. Yeah. I love it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, you know, um, it's, a it's, again, it's, again, it's again the idea of, of you know being alien and so on, like you know, within, within the '90s with the decolonized the architecture, right? But uh, at the moment, um, you know, the economy, the economy behind it might be, uh, you know, a very, very interesting um, uh, situation. Okay. Um, the question. Uh, was uh, what is the audience? Uh, it doesn't have to be like person-wise. No, I, th I think audience is actually an interesting word that you use as opposed to client or occupant or something. And there's a there's a very interesting sense of terminology that's specific to architecture that I think Dominic's starting to to touch on and I'll sort of gear it more towards my perspective that architecture is an interesting field where. Oftentimes, the client that you're dealing with, but at least not in the discipline, but in the actual practice realm of things, the client isn't actually the occupant. So there isn't audience in the traditional sense that you're catering to someone's uh, experiences within a building. So I think that's it's actually a really strange relationship that your your you know designs are being approved by the people that aren't actually intended to be using them. That's it. But uh, as far as the, the scope of, of audience, if, if you could put things into sort of three categories of like body, mind, and uh, let's say like behavior, brain, and world, I'm not interested at the world scale. I'm very much more interested in behavior and architecture's ability to manipulate behavior. Um, as opposed to creating new perspectives, let's say. Uh, I think creating new perspectives is really just something looking different or looking funny from what's usual, but 
the ability for architecture to manipulate behavior through new forms is, I think, really cool potential. But it's the behavior of the people. It's not the behavior of, let's say, an architecture, the architecture. Correct. Of what? Correct. Yes, I, I, would, I would agree. That, that is the intention. And then through the, um, maybe to, to take it one step further, that you can sort of infuse new values into new form that you've experienced through the behavior. So the idea that, you know, the way a building looks reflects the ideals of that society. And when the ideals of that society change, architectural movements sort of adjust with it. Um, I think is a really strong potential then for it to speak very directly to the time that you are designing, as opposed to the need to reference the past or look towards the future. I'm not so interested in, you know, pretending to know what the future would be. I'm very much more interested in, you know, what the present is, or let's say the next present that's along the way. Um, I think there's often a misconception that formalists today are interested in, like, they, they render things in this very apocalyptic manner, uh, but there's this bleak outlook for the future, and I, I, I would tend to gravitate more towards an understanding of a very uh, optimistic, so like relentless optimism, I think is, is important for the profession, especially given the sort of political and economic uh, environment that we exist in today. Uh, and then the question is, um, um, or I can reformulate it. That's, yeah, but I want to say that in a different way, in a different fashion. Um, okay. Um, uh, who or what do you do it for? Not that far. <laughs> um, I like the old school guys, you know. Or let's do it first this way. You said we we're going to talk about form and about uh, formalism, and I think uh, uh, formalism is a way of reading, or it used to be a way of, of reading. Uh, you can understand. Uh, form because uh, it's part of a system to see that whatever. So on that last level and to come back to the topic a bit, um, I uh, think the audience is those who know how to uh, read architecture, which is not obvious. I mean, a lot of stuff around here or anywhere is just built for uh, pragmatic purposes, which is fine. There's nothing there to read about in terms of architecture. I mean, it's dense, it's uh, not wet, and so on, fine. But the analysis, uh, you know, which is the whole image I'm really interested in, uh, of, you know, the Warburg Institute and uh, Alden Rowe and those people who actually defined um, ways to understand architecture in terms of formal reading is what I'm interested in and then I'm also interested in producing some stuff that can be understood this way and in that tradition. But um, that's one group of old school guys that I relate to when you ask me about you know, this or who's that for. The other uh, group of uh, old school guys is you know uh, Michael Heitzer and all these land art dudes or even, you know, Sandor, I mean, he wouldn't care, you know, he would hope that in 200 years, and he stated that as a quote, you know, hopefully, in 200 years, there's going to be people who can understand. But, but I like the rashness of uh, Heiter, you know, we went to the West Coast looking for some uh, land art, he would buy the whole land where you could not go unannounced unless he shoots at you, and he's building a whole city for some other civilization, as long as you've got the money uh, in from the room, but uh, it's a really nice um, art project in um, Nevada uh, that's uh, just built for the future.
and not being understood now. Uh, but, but, but then uh, the third audience is uh, really also related and I like what Dominic says about this distributed network currently. That's I think a very contemporary uh, way um, of collaborating and so then the audience is those who kind of share the same kind of rules, descriptions. Uh, so that uh, one can share, or at least, uh, you know, collage parts of these elements. Uh, I would even say part of the processes together. I, I really like uh, the kind of processual collage, that uh, the, you know, sharing of uh, little bits of scripts, little bits of funding, little bits of anything allows you to get. Unless you had a specific follow-up question. Okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious if you ask who it's for with a cynical agenda that you want someone to say me. Because I think that's normally how people see things, that a formalist does things out of their own fascinations. So I was curious if you wanted to like, trap someone into that and you had you know, a desire to sort of debunk that myth or reinforce it. Um, I wouldn't really mind if uh, anyone answered that. Um, what I was kind of expecting, and, and uh, maybe I misunderstood, but nobody uh, said that, uh, I would expect that an answer I do it for the architecture or for the discourse. Or that's people who understand, but, but maybe, but maybe that's what you said. People who understand are uh, the people who are uh, making it for, or the thing itself. But doing it for myself is, is a is this a fair answer? Anything? Why not? But well, nobody did. Well, is it a trap? The thing is, that they, do, you, do you find this a, a trap? No, I, 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 not a trap. I mean, more just curious to see the the reaction or the response. But I think a lot of people would accuse formalists of doing things out of their own fascinations. But I think the problem with that is that you you change fascinations and what you like today is different than what you like tomorrow and so it's, it's more important then to build arguments as opposed to fascinations which would be the difference but I don't think having fascinations is a bad thing I think it's a combination of the two that becomes the productive relationship that's how I would answer that Anyone on that? Uh, you will have one more chance to ask something uh, I mean the audience um, before you, I'm sure you've noticed, we have a sound, uh, sound background um, by Daniel Tog. Uh, I, would, I would like to ask you um, if um, you can um, uh, answer in English or it's not getting there. Um, you've been playing something that is generative, right? Uh, could, you, could you explain a little what, what, is, what, is, what can be here in the background? Yeah, well, it was an algorithmic composition which I programmed and it's made of two parts. One is generating the sound which is based on physical model of Tibetan bowls, kind of, and the way you, you play them. But it's kind of reshaped continually into different metallic shapes with different resonances. And the way it's reshaped is controlled by output from some chaotic equations which are also continuously ch changing the pitch in this way because if you have different shapes it gives you different frequencies so it's co composed by chaos and this was actually just a light version of the deepest ball because not to interfere with the speaking words so that people could understand and after the discussion I would like to play the full version of it to turn on all the balls okay. um, um, yeah before we would um, and now is the very last moment for you um, Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll get one more question, but, but you, you can answer briefly. Uh, uh, you, you can answer that you're not interested in the question. Um, 
Um, the reason why we are having the, the sound background and, and usually some, some DJing um, also is that, that I like to see how um, other disciplines are thinking. Um, do you do you look for an inspiration or maybe not an inspiration, maybe maybe part of the research um, in the different disciplines, outside of architecture, uh, different arts, uh, that, or is this even an interesting question? Fair question, and I think it's interesting that you bring it up now because it was specifically something that last time we did this, you said you didn't want us to talk about. So I would be curious to see what uh, sort of was the change of heart with respect to uh, putting it back on the table. Uh, I would say for me and uh, what we do in Excessive, oftentimes it seems that uh, the world of fashion and high fashion has a lot that is really pushing the limitations of the, the material world um, as opposed to the, you know, pushing ideas forward because I think for us it's very important, or for me it's very important that the changes sort of, let's say when you develop new technologies or new architectures, they are often related to new developments in material technologies and that's oftentimes uh, what's driving the, uh, the discipline forward. And I think it's really great when you can sort of find marriages between disciplines that are really interested in pushing material technologies simultaneously. And I, I think fashion is one of them that, that does it very well uh, as far as the, the way they've developed machines to sort of 3D print fabrics. And they can do things in, in such a, a realm that they get very quick feedback that you're able to sort of exploit because one of the problems with architecture, not necessarily as a discipline but as a profession, is that it moves extremely slowly. That uh, it's difficult to realize your ideas and have them continue to be relevant at that moment, at least outside of academia. So I think that's one of those moments where you can sort of uh, find connections between the two. What I would say that interests me more about, uh, so there was a Bart Hess lecture this past Thursday at the Angabanza, and I found it really interesting the way he worked, and it was very similar to the way we work in Excessive and how I work personally, that he considered himself not someone that was involved in the world of fashion, but it was more that he was designing materials, and that was sort of the end product for him. So in my opinion, he sort of stopped it too early, and he handed it over to someone else to decide how to utilize uh, what it was that he was developing. And so for me, it was that he stops at what I would consider the research phase, that he's just researching, and that uh, the interest then becomes how you take those moments and you, you know, find a way to implement them into the discipline. Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, just, uh, just to give you a quick answer, uh, since I'm, I'm sort of both musician and designer, um, the, the funny thing is that um, you know I have quite a lot of ideas musically, but I'm not such a great musician. So uh, so basically, I come up with a lot of ideas while you know playing with someone, or, you know, or, so, or alone, or improvising, and just you know making a piece. But you know, I, I think I'm a little bit more skilled designer. So it's easier for me to express all these ideas in a visual manner. Uh, yeah, the, the ideas that I get from from, from sounds and the relation between sounds. So it's a uh, you know if, if this answers your, your question, I'm uh, trying to to be fair with my skills. And you know I think faster in music, but I express things faster in design. So that's the deal. Uh, we should play someday because. <laughs> uh, Used to as well, or still am. But uh, we had one of the more interesting uh, works at school uh, as a collaboration with painters uh, on a common ground of uh, music, specifically Zanakis. And uh, actually, it seems that some concepts uh, work across different boundaries. Of course, Zanakis was a musical composer and an architect and we know all about him and it was a big show 
also in the drawing center at that time in New York. Uh, but, but this idea of randomness order uh, or, or degrees of randomness actually, you know, uh, stochastics possibilities of calculating the position of something to appear randomly like, like that you have there is a, is a score. Uh, you can see it on top is a score from uh, Pitopracta, which is uh, basically the pitches going back and forth um, and appear, uh, appearing as a cloud of sound uh, that I'll uh, try to find here. That, um, cannot be controlled one by one, but uh, more like clouds in uh, various uh, envelopes is a concept that we then utilize as but that's also very interesting to me. And of course, there are contemporary uh, concepts that, 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 that don't have a specific medium. Uh, yeah, I mean, old school modernism would say, yeah, painters have to deal with the flatness of the surface, with the, uh, composition that's uh, centrifugal, centripetal, but I'm really interested, especially with music, to, to exchange these ideas because they are almost you know more abstract and faster and less material and can you know cyclate faster. You know different rhythms if it's the right can be used as structural uh, rhythms, architecture, and all that stuff. I'm you know often considering the ideas also uh, a bit less uh, crystallizing the medium. But in this case, maybe maybe a picture you are looking at, and also also the representations of Yanis uh, and is is uh, the same is the same issue of finding a representation. That's what Taylor was talking about at the very beginning with the cross on uh, sections. Um, maybe you have to uh, the similarity would be that you have to find a different way of uh, representation. And uh, the interesting part is that, that again, it's, it's a certain kind of a line or, or a linear shape. Uh, again, also in music and also in uh, in architecture. Last one. Okay. Um, so I'm not giving you the opportunity anymore. Uh, um, I would like to thank the guests, Peter Stetz, Dale Bornstein, Dominic Strelet, Dale Tom. We are going to have um, um, uh, the, the musical performance. I would like to thank you for uh, uh, being focused all the time. And um, I also have to say that um, uh, we are thankful to, to this venue, Ashkiri, Monte Cristo and also to the Ministry of Culture, Slovak Republic, that is supporting this, um, this international cross-border um, uh, event. And please uh, enjoy. Thank you. Thanks.